men are more lonely than ever. Now, some of you are saying, well, aren't we all? Everyone seems to be lonely in our present day culture. And yes, that's true. We live in a culture of extreme individualism. And then you add to that the extreme isolation that we experience in the culture in which we live in. And yes, it is the dang screens. If you were here last week, uh, I do apologize to some parents if you had language. I said dang when I said that, and I do apologize, and I guess I'm saying it again. So I've recreated a problem. But it is the phones, it's the devices, it's the mind-blowing upgrades in virtual online technology. The, The world we live in, it seems constantly in our own little spaces with our own little screens. And in this world, Even so, women are still more skilled and way more intent on making friends. And yet men in this isolated world say that their online life is way more rewarding than real life. You see, women get depressed and anxious and miserable when they are online, when they are involved in sort of fake artificial relationships. But the way men are wired up, they are almost drawn to that as a way out. 41% of women say that they have had a meaningful conversation with a close friend in the last week. 15% of men say they do not have a close friend at all. And 25% of single men under 30 would say that they do not have a close friend. Now, this is really bad for society. It's bad for everyone involved when men live this isolated, lonely life. Single men are shaped by this digital world that they've grown up with, video games, the the sort of online virtual world that they become addicted to before they leave home. And by the time they leave home, they have the slightest skill in communication and the slightest desire to have healthy interaction with friends or, or even more women. They don't even, they're not even drawn to that. They're content to live in isolation The average age for marriage for men right now is 30 in our country. And two-thirds of college-educated men say they do not intend to marry. And it's not just single men. Empty nest is hitting men harder in our current culture. And we always think about the mom who's going to miss her children But with men, we work behind screens, we work in isolation all day, and then we come home and everyone in our house is isolated in their own space. But for some time, at least there is the presence of others in our home. And then the kids leave home and the house is quiet. And everything that you've invested in and worked for is gone. And men are asking Why do I exist? What is my purpose now that this house is empty? And for men above the age 50, suicide, alcoholism, and pornography are at the highest rates that they've ever been. They're astonishing because men are more lonely than ever. And so why such devastation? Well, we see in verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. Last week, we talked about the reality that men and women both are created in the image of God. They're created to bring life into the world. They're created to steward order in the world, bringing chaos into surrender and submission. They're created to know and obey God. We are created to know and obey God personally. And then here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, last week we zeroed in on the creation of Adam. Here we zero in on the creation of Eve, the woman. And we begin to see uh, even 
a, a more bigger picture, a broader picture of what it means to, to live in a world as men and women created in the image of God. Notice verse 18, as God has created man, there's anticipation in the text when we get to this point. We read in chapter 1 that God created man and woman in His image for His glory. And here, as we've, we've, we've gone from verse 26 all the way to verse 18 in chapter 2, there's an anticipation. What about the woman? What, what about her creation? And notice the state at which, in which she is created. Man is alone. And God says, it is not good that man should be alone. In general, we aren't created to live in this world alone. We are created to know and be known in relationships, ultimately to know and be known by God. And so at this point, it's just Adam and God declares, God declares this. It's not just an experience. It's not just an assumption. God declares with his word, with authority, as he looks at his creation, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, we read in chapter 1, after every day and during every day, God looks upon his creation and he would say what? It is good. It is good. He sees it and it is good. It is good. It is good. And then we get to the end of chapter 1 and after woman is created, God says it's complete. It's very good. But we go back before the creation of woman and before she is created, God says, I want to remind you, before she was created, it was not very good. It wasn't good until she was created. The Lord said this. It is not good that man should be alone. But notice what God's going to do about it. He says, I will make him a helper fit for him. God says, I will personally design human life for the good of Adam, for the good of man. I will personally do this. And notice the word he uses, I will make for him a helper. And so often we read that and we think, yeah, God's going to make Adam a sidekick, an assistant. And that's not at all what this word means. This word is actually used of God, and it means to fill up what is lacking, it means to strengthen. It means that there is a need, and throughout the Old Testament, God is the only one who can meet that need, and He steps in and becomes our helper. He fills us. He strengthens us. And so that is the glory of woman. She's not just a helper, sidekick, off to the side. She's not just going to help Him do some work. No, she fills this void in creation, that only God can do. God can only meet this need, and He does so, so through the creation of woman. But she is a helper in the sense of she strengthens and fills what is lacking. As Adam has been called to take dominion, he cannot do it at this point. He needs this void filled. Notice helper fit for him. The word here means, it, it's kind of hard to translate. It means according to the opposite of him. It means there's something different than Adam that he needs, but this, what is different still fits him. In, in some sense, it is like a puzzle piece that is missing at this point. It is the opposite. It is like him, but it is missing. And he needs something else that will fit him. And we've seen that in chapter one as we've talked about the way in which God created the world in such a binary way. I know that's a buzzword now, but God created the world binary. We have heaven and earth. We have light and darkness. There are these two things that are opposite, but they are equal, and they are both needed for creation. You have day, and you have night. You have land, and you have water. You have sun, and you have moon. And here you have man. What else is needed? What else is lacking? It is woman. 
There are two equal, opposite, necessary components to creation that are needed for dominion. And here, man needs the equal and opposite, which is woman. And notice verse 19. How does God do this? Now out of the ground, the Lord God had made every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And so God zeroes in, and how is he going to create life for Adam? Well, he calls Adam to to look at creation and not only just to look at creation, he, give, he reminds Adam of his authority over creation. Man was created to have dominion over all of life, all, over all of the created things. And in the same way in chapter 1, God would see something and call it something. He, he would exercise his dominion over the light when he called it day. And over the darkness, when he would call it night, what's God doing in naming those things? I have authority over those things. And he says to Adam, you have authority over every living creature. Go name them. And he sets Adam up for anticipation here. As Adam begins to exercise authority over all the created life, living creatures, he realizes that something is missing. Notice verse 20. The man gave names to all livestock and the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. From the world in which God created and gave life, there was no life that fit him. Now, obviously, he would have seen the animals and each one had a male and female counterpart. And they were were, uh, created to to have dominion in some sense. They were created to produce life in the world. And he sees the male and female and he says, okay, that's possible in the animal world, but it's not possible in my world. There's no necessary counterpart for Adam for life here. And in this section, we see that God has designed the world for man to need woman. At this point in the passage, That is what is anticipated. There is something missing. And it's not just something lost. It's something that hasn't been created yet. The world is not very good yet. And Adam feels and sees. This is what the purpose of God having him name the animals. He wants him to fill this void. He wants him to fill this need. It's not there. He experiences it. And the dilemma is not that Adam just needs help with some work. He just, something another man could have done, a horse or a mule. I just gotta, I gotta get to work. How am I gonna do this? I need some help. No, humanity, get this, humanity does not exist without the unique design and dominion of a woman. Humanity, human life doesn't come into the world until there is a woman This is the need that must be filled by God. This is the helper that must come into the world. And it's not just biology. We see how women are created. And and the amazing way that they bring life and they bring beauty into the world. And even at this point, think about the world in which God had created before Eve. We would say, it's beautiful. There's life all around. And yet God himself would say, no, but there's still something missing. There's still something even more beautiful and life-giving that has not been brought into the world yet. And it is woman. She has not been brought into the world yet. And so it's not just biology the woman gives life and beauty to the world. And, and, and this is the way it works out specifically in marriage. Husbands are called to lead, protect, and provide. And, and men, you have to step in and lead and help with the children and give direction for your home. But, but then the wife also adds beauty to all of the plans. 
Uh, uh, wives, as you call your husband to step in and lead and protect and provide, I also want you to ask him, and what are your plans for your life? What sort of visions and hopes and dreams do you have? Because you are to add life and beauty to those things. Uh, my wife, Danae, is, has done this to everything I've ever been a part of. Plans and agenda, ministry, whatever I've been involved with. I, I am more rugged and, and I'm a list person and, and I know the next step of everything and I plan. And without her, I would be so boring. I would be so hard to deal with. We're planning the marriage workshop, and I'm like, Danae, I have this, this vision for this. I want to do this. I want to help married couples in our church, and, and I have the workbooks, and I have the content, and I have the schedule, and I have all of that, and then I just say, here, add your pizzazz to it. Like, bring this thing to life, and you come in, and they're nice. They're, there's actually, there were actually plants on the table yesterday. I don't know how you did that in the middle of winter, and everything's nice and pretty. And you're able to, to, to speak into one another's life in, in different ways. And it's not just in family, it's also in ministry. Jesus believed this about women. Women were necessary for the move of the kingdom. When Jesus came into the world and taught and did ministry, Mary gave birth to Christ. She was an instrument of glory that brought the Messiah into the world. We read of Jesus' ministry and women. We're not even, we don't even know if they were married. Their husbands are not even spoken of. They gave money to Jesus' ministry. They hosted parties in their home. Women became his closest friends. They prepared his body for burial. Women were the first to witness the resurrection. And God is saying that this story is incomplete without women being a part of it. And we see that in the move of the gospel, in the book of Acts, and even in the pastoral epistles. We have Lois and Eunice who discipled Timothy. We have Priscilla, Lydia, Phoebe, Eodia, and Syntyche who are said to have labored with the apostle Paul for ministry. Many of these women, we don't even know if they were married. We're to assume most of them weren't. But they were needed for the sake of the gospel and planting the church to the ends of the earth. And I want to say to you today, our church is full of women at all stages in life. And we would not be the church that we are without you. I want you to know that, that we know that and we feel that and we believe that. Married women, single women, women who have gone through divorce, women who are widowed and they're able to step in and they're able to bring life in places that we can't, even as your pastors, we know that we are dependent on you to step in cer certain situations and do discipleship and give life and even beauty in those situations. And without you, it's not just that task wouldn't be accomplished. There, we would lack so much hospitality. Our worship would be missing something on a Sunday morning. The wisdom that, that we have in this church would be missing you add so much to this church, I never want you to think that you don't. We do have views of strong leadership when it comes to men, but we can't do what we're responsible for without you. You add beauty and life to it all. And so how does God create Eve? How does he create woman? Notice verse 21. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into woman and brought to her. We see this beautiful picture of exactly how God creates woman. And remember, man was taken out of the dust. Here, she is taken out of man. That doesn't mean she's lesser. In some sense, she is way more precious in her creation. And other commentators have said, and notice, she is taken from his side. She is equal. She is under his arm for protection. It's a beautiful way in which God has brought womanhood into the world. And notice he says, he made into, he personally created and designed. And then what does he do? He brings woman to man. He presents her. 
He says, Adam, I know the world is missing life and beauty in this way. Adam, I know you are missing something. So I'm going to create it from you, and then I'm going to present it to you. It's the first wedding ever in the garden where God the Father presents man with his bride. If Adam represents mankind as the capstone of creation, here, even beyond that, woman is the crown jewel of humanity. She is at the top in some sense when it comes to beauty and life. The world was incomplete until she was there. And here God puts her on display for man and presents him to man. And then notice Adam's response. Then man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He's stunned. And up until this point, there's no concept of a woman. And now he sees her and he is amazed. He is in awe of what he sees. And, and, and what he's saying is, how in the world did you create this from me? He, he would never have expected this. She is of the same substance. And the word used here when he says, she shall be called woman... Because she was taken out of man. The words used here, they have the same root in Hebrew, but they sound different. And there's a word play here. They're the same, but they're different. In some sense, they are the same word, but they sound different. They're the same. Adam is saying, she's same of my same. And in this moment, I don't know how to explain it. Because she's also different. And this is mind-blowing. And here's the reality. To deny that men and women are of the same essence diminishes the glory of God. Now, none of us would say that. But even attitudes, sort of stereotype ways in which we talk, that diminishes the glory of God. And it's harmful to the gospel. Both men and women are image bearers, honored as co-heirs of grace. In the gospel, this is what happens. Men and women have the same status in Christ. Men have no more rights to the kingdom than women. But let me say this too. Women are no more spiritual because they're women. Both are important points to make. We're both created in the image of God, and we're both co-heirs in the kingdom. And so to deny this diminishes the glory of God, and to minimize differences in our essence minimizes the glory of God. We have to talk about the fact we are different, and God created us that way. An androgynous humanity doesn't honor God. Christ is a groom. The church is a bride. He created gender for the sake of the gospel. And early on in your kid's life, when you want to teach them a God-sized view of the world, God-centered theology, I want, to, I want you to think about your life in light of God, you set them down and you say, praise God that He created you a boy. Praise God you're a boy. And then the girl, you, praise God you're a girl. All the amazing things that you can do as a girl, this is amazing and God did this. God, no, no, you don't get to decide. God decided when he brought you into the world. And we're going to honor him in the way that you were created. And it's so important for the church to realize this in our current culture. We live in a culture that is blurring distinctions when it comes to women and is committed to cast dispersion on manhood. And yet in the church, we notice and we encourage masculinity in the church. And we're going to see here the essence of masculinity is sacrifice. How do we know this? Jesus is the man. And what does he do? He sacrifices for the church. And so I know there's talk about toxic masculinity. Genuine masculinity cannot be toxic. What you're talking about is little bitty boys who haven't grown up. Masculinity sacrifices for the good of others, and we see this in Jesus. 
And so in a world where you're casting dispersion on men, we should rise up and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me tell you about the men in my church. They're godly. They love their wives. They give over for the sake of the gospel. They're raising their kids. The ones who are single, they give all of their time for the sake of the church and the gospel to the ends of the earth. You should hear where some of them are going and sacrificing their life. Let me tell you about what manhood looks like. You don't know. Social media can't tell you. Your YouTube videos can't tell you what manhood is like. But the Bible does, and I see it in the men that I go to church with. And in the same way, we encourage femininity for God's glory. In a world where women are treated as just objects for pleasure, where there is this clamoring, uh, where, where men are being taught that there is this clamoring from the female world in which they, all, all women really want to do is nag. All they really want to do is take your money. All they really want to do is make your life miserable. We as men should say, stop. I, I always, I never around here say you should get involved in controversy on social media. Don't do it. But men, there may be times where you need to speak up and say, you don't know what womanhood is really about. Let me tell you about my wife. Let me tell you about my daughters. Let me tell you about the women I go to church with. Let me tell you about what womanhood looks like in the context of the world. Because there is so much confusion. There, there, it is the work of the enemy to divide the two genders and cause them to war against each other. And in the context of the church, we can't do it. We love one another, and we love the fact that you were created a woman. We love the fact that you were created a man, and we're going to honor the gospel and the kingdom together in the context of the church. But here we see the culmination of the creation of man and woman is in the institution of marriage. Notice verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become flesh. Therefore, notice the word therefore, it is purpose. I know we say that a lot when we study our Bibles, but here it is a strategic purpose. God has created woman in this way that she fits man. And because of the differences and the fit, they are to be joined together. And all of the language here is covenantal language. And notice the description of the covenant. You are under the authority of your family, father and mother. You leave, in some sense, you turn from that family, and you leave that authority, and then you cling to your wife. You cling to, to this new family, and, and you do so in the context of a covenant. Notice the words, they shall become one flesh. Just the picture there is of a covenant. This is how covenants were made, the imagery you are stuck together in an agreement. You have become one in a promise. And you can't separate from this agreement. You can't separate from this promise. You are under oath to each other. And you are one flesh. This is just how stuck together you are. That if you were to separate, you would rip your flesh. And you would die. That's why covenants were sealed with blood. To indicate if you break this covenant, you deserve to die. That's why in the Old Testament, it was the death penalty for adultery and divorce. Now there are reasons for that as we get to the New Testament. Abandonment, adultery, abuse. But the marriage covenant was to be forever. For life. And if you broke it, you killed someone. If you broke it in any way, there was death involved because you were one flesh and the two had become one and now can't live without each other. So if you're married here today or getting married or want to be married, thinking about marriage, well, just everybody. 
Marriage is a covenant. It's not friendship. Not romance. Not companionship. It's not an event. It's not a wedding. It is a covenant before a holy God. Where you say to a, another person, a man or a woman, it's between one man and one woman, be very careful. And you say to that person, I'm becoming one with you and I will never leave you or forsake you. We're one. And to separate should cause damage to us and will cause damage to us and does. To both of you, to your kids, to your family. It is a covenant you have made that is essentially sealed with your life. That is not to be forsaken. And everything flows from that covenant. If you replace in marriage anything with the covenant, you're going to have problems. Finances, kids, mission plans in life. If anything else moves to the center besides the covenant, it will not be sustained. And your kids and the world around you should know that you are not bound to anyone the way you are your spouse. That the people around you should notice it. When people say, what is his mission in life? What are his values? What defines that man? Jesus and Danae. He's bound to her in a way he's not bound to Ashland Church. He is bound to her in a way he is not bound to his six kids. He's bound to her in a way that he is not bound to Tennessee football. They they are one flesh and you cannot separate them. And your kids better know this, parents. They better know that you care way more about your spouse than you do them in some sense. Now, it's a different care and it's a different love. I'm not saying don't love and care for kids. But your kids should know there is a unique way that they love one another. And I ain't a part of that. And why should they know that? Because they need to know you ain't coming bet- they ain't coming between you. And after I leave and I'm gone, they're still going to be together. That's this picture of the gospel forever and ever. But it is a one flesh covenant. They were made for one another. But notice the result of this. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is how this chapter ends. When we get to the next chapter, there's a lot of nakedness and there's a lot of being ashamed through the rest of Genesis. Sin comes into the world and this relationship, there's not this complete trust. Adam and Eve begin to hide. When we read the story of Abraham, who, yes, he leaves his father in Ur and we think he's going to cling to his wife, but what does he do? He clings to his slave girl because he doesn't trust God. We move through the book of Genesis. And we see sodomy and sin in places like Gomorrah. There's polygamy that comes about. We get to the story of David, and he clings to another man's wife. You want to look at the world around you and say, oh, this is a pit. Read about your heroes in the Bible. This glorious thing called marriage is marred with sin and death. Beginning in the next verse, in chapter 3. Marriage is, it's like this atomic bomb that could be used for good, and yet it has exploded in our face, and it has caused so much pain and suffering in the world. The reality is getting married is hard, being married is hard, staying married is really hard, and it all brings about difficulty and pain. I want to say to you today, sometimes conversations around here are just really raw, okay? Okay. But but I want to say to you as a church, we have to have a balanced view of this. There are people in the room who the issue of marriage has caused great heartache. Like I said, divorce, death, widows and widowers who are in the room. And this issue of marriage is really hard for them. And by the way, you know what? They saw it as the next passage of Scripture, and when it was negative three this morning, instead of saying, I I don't need to hear that, they're here. Even though it's hard and it's really difficult for them. And praise God for you. 
Praise God for you. Because this passage can bring about a lot of pain and heartache. And we have single women in our church who are amazing. They don't want to sing at another wedding. You did you say, oh, he went there. I got permission. They don't want a babysit again. They don't want to keep your dog when you go on the couple's retreat. And you know what? They do it so many times without even being asked. Why do they do it? Because they love you. And they're happy for you. And they love the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his glory is so important to them. Here's the reality. We have to be sad for one another while at the same time being happy for one another. That's the beauty of the church. We don't pick sides. It's messy. It's difficult. It's hard. And we have conversations like this. But marriage is good. And it is for the glory of of God. And we must honor it. But we also must say it's really hard. And for the glory of God, we have to bear with one another. And so what's the solution? Well, the good news is Earthly marriage is not ultimate. It's not ultimate. What is ultimate? The gospel. And so when God is forming Eve and when he is instituting this amazing covenant of marriage, you know what God is thinking about? The gospel. The gospel wasn't created for marriage. Marriage was created to reflect the gospel. Jesus dying for the church and the church loving and respecting Jesus. And and when marriage is good, it points to this big, glorious truth. And when marriage is bad and the issue of marriage is hard, it causes us to long for this truth. And so that is the purpose of marriage in the world. It is to point to the gospel, but also to call us to long for the gospel You see, the truth is, God sovereignly decided that it was not good for His Son to be alone. And the Son left heaven to hold fast and become one with His bride by dying for her on the cross. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ was taken from the side of the Son of God as He was put to sleep in a tomb after dying for our sins. This is how God created a bride for His Son, the church. And if you are here today by faith in Jesus Christ, believing in Him, not of your works, not of your righteousness, not of being married or un- not married, but, but, but by the blood of Christ, His death and His life and His righteousness in your place, you believe in Him and you are made fit and you are made suitable for the Son of God by His blood and His righteousness, nothing within you. And you become one with Christ in a way that you could not become one flesh with anyone else. You are immersed into him and his identity becomes your identity. You are counted righteous and you are counted redeemed and you are counted forgiven in him. You're immersed into him. And for all of us, all of us, Man, woman, in the image of God, here today, co-heirs of the kingdom. There's something missing. There's still something missing. God looks at the world, marred with sin. He sees the redemption of his church. He says, there's something missing. I will make for them a wedding feast. And he's preparing a wedding feast of the Lamb where we will be presented to Jesus pure and holy. The reality is you were not created for marriage, but you were not created to be alone because you were created for Christ.